production by Michael Lofton. In the Catholic tradition, there's the beatific vision where, Mm -hmm. um, you know, after death, a person by grace is able to encounter the essence of God, not comprehending it, but and um, in, in a limited way as fitting for a creature. Um, whereas it sounds like the essence and energies distinction says that one, even post uh, death, never actually encounters the essence at all, but only the uh, uncreated energies. Mm-hmm. How can these two things be reconciled or can they not be reconciled? Yeah. Um, I think philosophically um, we have to remember that uh, it's already been demonstrated, I think by uh, very philologically meaning back to the original words, word by word quotations that are being used by Palamas, somebody like uh, John Dimitri Kopoulos, whom you've probably heard me, if I haven't mentioned him before, he's maybe been mentioned elsewhere, but uh, John Dimitri Kopoulos uh, is a good example uh, he can show that a lot of the sources that Palamas is using are Neoplatonism. And this is philosophical speak, using categories which are a mishmash of Aristotle and Plato to talk about things. So um, I think that we can talk philosophically about the essence and energies because Palamas talked philosophically about the essence and energies. And in the West, we have to remember that by the time this debate happens between the Latins and the Greeks, we all have the same roughly speaking, they're the same sources. Whereas Palamas has Proclus and Pseudo-Dionysius, uh, who are essentially 6th century uh, and uh, authors, 5th century and 6th century authors. Uh, the Latins by now have this Arabic text, which is essentially Proclus's theology. And uh, they also have uh, Pseudo-Dionysius in a number of translations. And so if we can talk about the essence and energies together, can we speak in the same language? We can, and Palamas did. Uh, And the question is, from you, is beatific vision, right? So now that we've established that philology, that is studying the original languages in which Palamas is quoting from ancients, we can establish these ancients that he's almost certainly or most likely quoting from Proclus, we're seeing that these same ancients are influencing the theology of Bonaventure and Aquinas and the Franciscan tradition. So what does that mean essentially? We can speak with the same terms. We can speak with the same terms. What are we saying with the beatific vision? Well, Palamas is not going to deny that the energies are essential, essential. So essence is a, is a noun, it's a substantive, and it means the God stuff, right? The, whatever it is that's most God, that's what we mean by his essence. And then if we talk about things that are essential to his essence, uh, or ideas, or notions, or realities that are essential to his essence, you see I'm switching there from the logical to the, uh, to the metaphysical, but uh, if, let's, let's talk about essential items, or essential realities, or essentialia, as we might call them in Latin. Um, what this means is an essence can be rich enough where there can be realities in it, which are co-existent, that is co-inexistent, that is that they come penetrate, kind of like dye penetrates water and you can't tell where the water and the dye are different. So an energy compenetrates the essence and it is contained, so to speak, in the essence and so you can't really divide the two. So if, if Palamas were to say something like, uh, I see the wisdom of God, but I don't see the essence of God, he is seeing the essential wisdom of God. So to that extent, it is a participation in uh, an essential reality of God, but it's not a participation in the fullness of God, of how he sees himself, his infinitude of being. Uh, we can understand his wisdom because that can be Uh, shared with us in a finite mode. Uh, And so what what we're saying here is that the way that the Palamite discussions go in some quarters, in some quarters, is to admit that um, everything that is said uh, about God's energies is said about essential energies, never things that are separate from the essence, but are 
uh, contained within, uh, co-infinite with, uh, realities that are uh, inseparable from the essence. Uh, now, we're not satisfied with that uh, in some Western quarters because we want to say that uh, the essence and the so-called activities are so united that if you see the essence of God, you see all these, uh, what can be said of, of, of these activities, you just see them as one simple whole. That's simply not the theory that's adopted by Palamas. So how do I summarize then Palamas's position? Um, you can see essential realities that are not divorced from God's essence. They are essential realities in God's essence. Is it the same as seeing the essence itself? No, it is not. Is it a participation in divine being? It is. Can we make sense of it in the Western tradition? The Franciscans, of course, did. Um, do, uh, does the West, by and large, when they talk about the beatific vision today, have any of that in the background of their minds or in their discussions? No, they don't. By and large, the um, Thomistic narrative and a more stringent Franciscan narrative uh, uh, seem to be a very diverse language from what Palamas is doing. Now, what I will say is this, is the discussion of the beatific vision in the West is oftentimes overlooked because when I believe it's, what is it, Benedict the Twelfth and uh, Benedictus Deus, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, he say he has this strange non-Thomistic language when he talks about seeing God and it's intuitive, which is intuitive. If you've done any, any studies in medieval studies or uh, the, the history of metaphysics in the West, the whole idea of intuitive knowledge of the divine essence is totally non-Thomistic. It's, I've looked for the word intuere and intuitive in Thomas. I think I found the verb, not the intuitive, the verb maybe two or three times. So what we're talking about is a 14th century expression of Benedict the 12th, who claims that we see the, the essence of God intuitively, uh, which does not commit us, in my mind, to some uh, very, very stringent notion of what even that beatific vision is. Is it possible to make room for a Franciscan, a very extreme Franciscan position on the beatific vision, even that goes beyond SCOTUS, I would say yes, because that we, we, we simply haven't had a historical study to show us if there is a text upon which Benedict XII is restricting the sense of the beatific vision to meaning only something like what Thomas Aquinas would argue. Yeah. Um, so you, you would, then it sounds like you would say that the Eastern tradition here and the um, Catholic traditions can be reconciled. Well, they can be reconciled if you say, is there a Catholic position that can be reconciled with what is the predominant Orthodox position? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me as a dogmatic theologian, pro provided that we all accept that every autocephalous Orthodox church and Orthodoxy today uh, would embrace as an official policy Palamism as the only way in which a theologian is allowed in, in good standing to talk about the beatific vision. Uh, so if we accept that as our premise, right? So Palamas is official in orthodoxy. The Great and Holy Council seems to affirm that. Uh, many of the canonists seem to affirm that the Palamite councils are quasi-ecumenical. Mm, the blogosphere seems to really like it. So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, that should be the last word, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, that settles yeah. it right there. <laughs> so provided that we all accept that Palamism, as we've come to know it, and its sense of the beatific vision is official orthodoxy, mm -hmm. can it be reconciled with Catholicism? No, because we have a plurality of choices in Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Can it be reconciled with extreme positions of the Franciscan position? Yes, it can. And were those Franciscans, at least within the margins of orthodoxy, Catholic orthodoxy? Yeah, they were. So I think that what you'll find is um, Orthodox today who are very committed to the ec ecumenical nature, uh, meaning the infallible nature of Palamas' teaching, could, I think, make uh, dogmatic arguments that they're not reconcilable with Catholicism because you don't get choices in Orthodoxy anymore, uh, whereas you do in Catholicism. Mm. And there you go. So you thought a cafeteria Catholic was, uh, you know, to be unorthodox in this particular case. We are cafeteria Catholics. We get a lot of choices.